This is taking a deeper look at the dialogue for inputting the flexible joint components. These values are going to be specified by each manufacturer of their joints. And you do need to contact them for this information if you don't already have it. Assemblies have to be modeled by individual flexible joints in Autopipe. So don't use any overall assembly values. If you have assembly values, you need to contact the manufacturer for the individual bellows information to plug that in correctly. So we need to plug in the length of the bellows. The axial stiffness is the amount of resistance for change in the axial length of the bellow from its free length in a direction parallel to its longitudinal axis. We have Y and Z shear stiffness, which is the relative stiffness of one end of the bellows to the other end in the direction perpendicular to its longitudinal axis. The torsional stiffness, uh, you know, is the amount of resistance in the rotation about the axis through the center of a bellows or the twisting. And the bending stiffness values is the amount of angular rotation, rotational resistance along the longitudinal axis of the bellow. You do need to plug in the weight of the bellows as well and the pressure area of the bellow. So we'll talk more about the pressure area in a moment. Here are some example catalogs just from DME, metal expansion joints on the left and senior flextronics pathway on the right. And often you can get these direct, directly from the manufacturer website. You can download the brochure. So that's you know, something that we've done for different types of bellows. When you're entering the stiffness values into the dialogue of the flexible joint. Keep in mind that Autopipe is asking for these in the local axis. This is something that's very important that might not be immediately known. If you use the contextual help on the shear or bending inputs, you will see these explanations shown on the left. For Y shear stiffness and or for Z shear stiffness, you want to enter a local Y or Z axis shear stiffness value or accept the default. And for Z bending stiffness or Y bending stiffness, you want to enter a local Y or Z axis bending stiffness value. So how do we know what the local axis of the pipe is? This actually used to be something that was a bit tricky for our users, but we've recently added a tool that helps users to see this information. On the View Ribbon tab, there is an option where you can select local axes up on the top. I'm showing with an arrow. And the pipe components will automatically become somewhat transparent, and each component will have a small local axis drawn inside of it along the center line. From this, it's very easy to see your local Y and Z directions with X always being along the axis of the pipe. And this is just an example. If it were mostly vertical piping, it's still really clear to see that local axis information. Again, X is along the axis of the pipe, and Y and Z are your bending or shear stiffness values. So we've seen tie rods used in different configurations, but let's understand those a bit further. When you enter tie link in the support type in the support dialog shown on the right, the dialog will be updated to include some additional fields. And the friction value will be zero by default. Just keep in mind that if friction is not present, the connected points are restrained only in a direction towards or away from each other. And this is common, but it's definitely important to understand that. Friction would provide restraining forces that are normal to that direction. A tie link can be used to model a pipe hanging from another pipe, a pipe supported by a beam member, or as in our case that we're talking about here today, it may be used to simulate the tie rods of a flexible joint. So we have an example tie rod here with an imaginary plane perpendicular to this axis, which is shown by the red lines. And the goal here is just to understand what the gap setting means. So in scenario one, if all gaps are zero, the node points can move anywhere on their respective perpendicular planes, but they cannot move further apart or closer together axially. In scenario two, if the gap forward is a value X and gap backwards is zero, this configuration allows the node points to move a total of X distance closer to each other on the established axis direction. And once that gap X is closed, the support becomes completely rigid again. And scenario three shows gap forward is zero and gap backwards is X. In this case, the node point can move a total of X distance away from one another on the established axis direction. And again, once that X gap is closed, the support becomes rigid again. All right, so let's make more sense of this using some uh, images. 
Here in Autopipe on the left, we have zero gaps forward and backwards. And so on the image on the right, it's showing that the nuts are tight to both sides of the plates or flanges, depending on the configuration. So the joints cannot expand or contract. See, these nuts are tight to the plates, right? Can't move axially. Here in Autopipe, we have a one inch gap forward. And in the same, the image on the right, it shows now that the nuts are tight to the outside of the plates, but the one inch gap is applied on the inside of one of the plates, which is shown by that orange line there, that orange shading. And so the joints here can contract one inch before the plate hits the nuts and it's stopped. So gap forward setting uh, means it can contract. Gap backwards setting. Here we have a one inch gap backwards and the image on the right is showing that the nuts are tight to the inside of the plate, but the one inch gap is applied on the outside of one of the plates shown in the blue shading. So here the joints can expand that one inch or whatever the gap is, but in this case it'll be one inch as in our example, and it'll expand one inch and then the plate will hit those nuts and then it will stop, it will not be able to expand anymore. It can go back and forth, you know, expand and then contract again, maybe in shutdown, that one inch, but that's all the movement that will be permitted axially. All right, let's have a little discussion about the pressure thrust area, the pressure area that's asked to be plugged in and what does that mean? If you use the contextual help, the online help says that this is the effective cross-section area, usually based on the mean diameter of the convolutions of the expansion joint. And it's multiplied by the internal pressure to obtain the axial thrust due to in internal pressure. This thrust is used if a rigorous pressure extension analysis is requested. So this means that if a pressure extension analysis is performed, a force is applied to the pipe at both ends of the expansion joint due to the pressure in the pipe. The direction of this force is axial and it's away from the expansion joint and the force is applied in each direction on both ends. The image on the right shows what is meant by the mean diameter of the convolutions of the expansion joint. Otherwise, if you enter zero into this pressure area, this effectively removes the pressure thrust load from the model and it will be ignored during the analysis, which you know, in turn might contain some unconservative results. So some flexible joint manufacturers refer to this as the effective area, or some might refer to it as a thrust area. And some will publish these values just directly in their catalog or product data sheets that are sent to their clients or that are available on their websites to download. So this is just an example on the left, again, from Senior Flexonics Pathway, uh, where it's showing the effective area. And on the right uh, here, I'm showing uh, an example for slip joints from Advanced Thermal Systems. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here. Just let's consider some important considerations. As we've seen, Autopipe lets the user define the stiffness terms of the flexible joint directly in that dialog. So there's no material property definition that's necessary for your flexible joint. With that in mind, we do want to understand some important considerations for using our flexible joints in the uh, Autopipe model. First, there's normal, no thermal expansion applied to the joint. There are no material properties applied to the joint. And when you look at your color-coded code stress plot, there, this is not applied to your flexible joints. We cannot do an analysis on your flexible joint components in Autopipe, and you'll see that they will stay gray in your color-coded plot if you actually take a, a zoom in and look at them. So it does not apply to your flexible joints. Now, going back to the idea of pressure thrust, you do have to check certain boxes on to include that. So this last note mentions that. So when a flexible joint is added to a model, it's suggested to also consider pressure extension and the axial P case in sustained options in that model. So I'll come back to here. Where do I turn those on? If I go to my analysis, static analysis sets, here is your pressure extension option for your static analysis sets. Enabling this, will force Autopipe to analyze all of your pressure cases corresponding to all of your thermal cases. And pressure extension is always gonna account for the pipe extension and bend extension or rotation caused by pressure. And it's required for buried piping or piping with flexible joints. When it's enabled, Autopipe applies equal and opposite pressure forces, your P times A, on each side of the flexible joint, where A is the pressure area that you input into the flexible joint dialog, 
And to dis disable this additional P times A force, you can just set the pressure area to be zero, but we don't recommend doing this. We recommend taking this into account. Okay, and the other option that I mentioned is in the results model options. Here is your include axial P case in sustained. And when this is checked on and you're including pressure extension, which you should be if you have flexible joints in your model, for cases where that when that's checked on, let's go back to the slide. The sustained equation will include axial gravity stress and also axial forces and moments from the maximum pressure extension or thrust case as well. So as an example here, I'm showing equation 15 from B311-2020 for the sustained calculation. And if you check on that include axial force option in the result model options dialog, this controls whether the FA term in the stress equation is set to zero. It will not be set to zero if that is checked on. One other note about pressure extension, uh, the first option that I showed for each static analysis set, the axial force that's reported in the code compliance for sustained category combinations has three components. It has your axial force due to gravity, your axial force due to longitudinal pressure, and the axial force due to pressure extension. The axial force due to longitudinal pressure is a reverse calculation from the longitudinal pressure stress. And the longitudinal pressure stress calculation is dependent on a result model option uh, that's available in the result model option dialog that I mentioned. When pressure extension analysis is performed, the axial force due to pressure extension is included in the axial force reported in the code compliance. And when it's not performed, the axial force reported in the co code compliance only includes the effects of axial force due to gravity and axial force due to longitudinal pressure. So these are important options for certain types of piping. And one of them is when you're including your flexible joint in your analysis. Here is something that a user sent in that's, you can see the design movements are highlighted. This is something that came from their manufacturer. And they asked, how do we plug in these design movements into my flexible joint component? And the answer is that you don't. These are generally not movements that are going to be forced on your joint, these are usually allowable movements. So what you need to do is model your piping, model your flexible joint correctly, set it all up, run the analysis, and then review the results. And you need to actually currently go into the start point and the end point of your flexible joint and calculate the displacement differences, which is what I had been doing through this whole entire session. I've kind of been just rounding and estimating, but you want to actually calculate at the start point of my expansion joint and the end point of my expansion joint, what is the difference in the XYZ displacements? Is that acceptable? And also the angular, if you have, and torsional, uh, if you have some, and you probably will, some, some requirements on that. Now, some good news. We do have a new feature that's coming out in the next release of Autopipe, the Autopipe 2023, looking at Q1 of 2023 release, uh, which will give us a report that will automatically calculate the difference between the displacements and rotations of your start point and end point of your expansion joints. So not a difficult thing to do, but can be, uh, it's just an, you know, an annoying manual thing that you've had to do. And now you don't have to do that anymore. We have a report that will produce these di differences for you, and then you can check them against your manufacturer allowables for these.